Good evening, and welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. My name is Rich Rupp. I, for the past 35 years, I've worked at a company in uh, Coventry called Arkwright Incorporated. Arkwright is celebrating its 200th anniversary. I started there in 1975. One branch of the Arkwright Mills were actually organized by the Textile Workers Organizing Committee in 1937. It became Local 167. Second branch was organized by the Textile Workers Union of America in 1962. They became Local 1554. In 1979, I became a shop steward and I've been on the executive board of Local 1554 ever since and currently I'm the vice president there. I am Ryan McIntyre. I'm a member of the Rhode Island Labor History Society and I am an executive board member. I have been for roughly two years. What brings us here today is to remember the great strike of 1934. The events that happened here in the cemetery enabled the Textile Workers Organizing Committee to come about and successfully start the organizing drive just after 1934. Textile industry in Rhode Island got its biggest jump in the Civil War. There were fortunes to be made selling cloth to the government and fortunes were made and the textile industry became the dominant industry in the state of Rhode Island for the next 70 years. However, by 1934, it had already gone through 10 years of decline, seeing the jobs go south. The estimates of how many textile workers there were in 1934 ranged from 50,000 to 70,000. In September 1934, the American Federation of Labor affiliated United Textile Workers orchestrated a general strike that extended throughout the country's textile factories, including here in Rhode Island. In particular, we're here today in Salesville, Rhode Island, at the Massachusetts Cemetery on Lonsdale Avenue to unveil a monument to the people who died here and also in Woonsocket as a result of the 1934 great textile strike. By 1934, the country was at the height of the Depression. The United Textile Workers of America organized its first strike nationwide. And since the majority of textile workers were on the East Coast, the 14 states from Maine to Florida were involved. One of the things or issues that the United Textile Workers had with mill management, not only here in Rhode Island, but up and down the East Coast, was outsourcing. A lot of the textile industry, mill management, was outsourcing those jobs to people in the South because they could hire them at a much lower rate. Outsourcing was going on. So the United Textile Workers wanted to develop a minimum wage scale to alleviate that and to make sure that someone that worked in a textile mill in the North was paid the same in the South. Unfortunately, that was one of um, the uh, negative outcomes of the strike that was unfortunately not able to happen right away but it would set the foundation for the Fair Standards and Labor Act of 1938 which would set those minimum wages th throughout the country. It would have a starting place in 1934 here in Salesville, Rhode Island. Management's reaction both here in Salesville and nationwide was to cut their pay was to overburden them with increased workloads, deteriorate the working conditions, not only here in the mills in Salesville, Rhode Island, but up on Winsocket and around the country. And that's what the United Textile Workers tried to demand from management, better wages and working conditions, and an end to the stretch out conditions that were happening not only here in Rhode Island but 
all up and down the eastern seaboard. And what I mean by the stretch out is that they would ask more from the employees, such as manning more machines within the textile factories, and also longer work days. Maybe they had a um, break three times a day. They might end that, and they might only have one break throughout the whole day, in addition to manning more machines. Also, an outcome of the strike was that it meant a rise of ascendancy for Rhode Island labor, both in politics and socially. Not only for um, unions, but the working class in general, regardless of their ethnicity, whether they be Irish, uh, um, Italian, Polish, French-Canadian, there was true working class solidarity. The United Textile Workers tried to bring out all textile workers starting the day after Labor Day in 1934. In Rhode Island, they were, they were very successful. The, the main problem that they saw was the plant just over the hill to our right, the Salesville Manufacturing Plant, refused to shut down. Picketers outside the plant were trying to get strike breakers out of the, to come out of the plant. The owner of the plant hired deputy sheriffs to protect his plant. The problem came about, the main problem came about when these deputy sheriffs felt free to manhandle the strikers. They were very liberal with the use of tear gas. For crying out loud, children going to school were tear gassed. They just indiscriminately fired tear gas into the crowds. When that didn't work, they actually started the fire. So the first shots were fired, the first three individuals were actually hit by gunfire by these deputy sheriffs just outside the Salesville plant over the hill. The National Guard came in to relieve the situation. The owner of the mill refused to, to take his deputy sheriffs away. They set up barricades. And the reason that we're here in the cemetery, the reason that the, the event in the cemetery actually took place was the strikers to bypass the roadblocks, crossed around behind the tree line and into the cemetery so they were now behind the National Guard. When the National Guard came around behind the plant and came up, that's where the event took place that we're here to honor today. That's the reason that the monument is here. The Labor History Society last year commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Salesville Massacre here in Salesville, Rhode Island at the Massachusetts Cemetery in Central Falls. We laid a wreath in honor of the people who fought and died for a better life for themselves and their families. After the ceremony, which roughly there is around 100 people at, in which we were very happy that we had that turnout, I mingled with the crowd. And one of the older gentlemen in the crowd sought me out. He pointed to me to come over. And in a soft voice, he said, good job, but why isn't there something more permanent here to memorialize the people who had lost their lives nearly 75 years ago? And I said, sir, that's a great idea, and I will definitely bring that up at our next executive board meeting. I went to the executive board at our next meeting and told them of the encounter that I had with the older gentleman. The board loved it, and, and it went over great. They thought it was a great idea. From that point, I took the lead in addition to establishing a research committee in which Nick Palazzo, Rich Rupp, and Adam Aquilenti, other members of our executive board, researched that particular event here in Searsville and also in Woonsocket to get the names of the people who had died and to get it right. From that point, we had to establish what we were actually going to erect here at the site. Different ideas, you know, sort of came to mind. But the one thing that all our society board members agreed on is to do the right thing and make it a permanent reminder of what happened here over 75 years ago in Salesville, Rhode Island. Over the course of the general textile strike in 1934, 40 individuals were shot and killed 
by government people. It's, one has to wonder what kind of mentality went through people's minds when it was open season on the working people. Here in Rhode Island, at least 13 people were hit by gunfire. That's not including hundreds of people, literally hundreds of casualties of people that were hurt in rock throwing, tear gassed, clubbed on both sides. But here in Rhode Island, four individuals paid the full price. And those were real people. Charles Gersinski, who was shot here in the cemetery, was 18 years old. The season before, he was a star player on the high school football team. William Blackwood was a 44-year-old Irish immigrant. He had lost his wife. He had lost his young daughter in childbirth. So he suffered all the tragedies of an immigrant to come here. And he was shot so badly in the head that they found his hat after he was taken away in an ambulance, and the hat had two bullet holes through it. Jude Cottermarch, who was shot in Woonsocket, was 19 years old. Leo Rouet, who was shot in Woonsocket, was only 17 years old. These were real people. Mr. Goskinski died within hours. Jude Cottermarch died within hours. William Blackwood would linger for almost a month. Leo Rouet would linger for two weeks before he died. When Charles Gersinski was buried, there were 3,000 workers who turned out for his funeral. When Jude Cordemach was buried, the crowd lined the streets from his home to the cemetery. So these people were true working class heroes. I contacted local, local vendors, local business people to sort of come up with ideas of exactly what we should place here, erect here in Salesville, Rhode Island. We decided we wanted a granite marker also with a plaque on it. The granite marker was done by M.F. Graham and Sun Monuments in Batucket, Rhode Island. They did a great job. They did a wonderful job. Also, the plaque was done by Healy Plaques in Manville, Rhode Island, in which they made a cast bronze plaque, 16 by 24, in which we put the names of the people who had died, our organization's emblem. We had funding from Working Rhode Island. We split the cost of erecting the monument, both the plaque and the granite headstone. We really appreciate Working Rhode Island for their generous donation. Also, we would like to thank George from the Musasic Cemetery Corporation for his consistent cooperation in our efforts here today and also last year at our event. I'm about 75 feet west of the monument that the Labor History Society has placed to commemorate the events of September 1934. But there is another monument to those events that shows the true tragedy of what took place here, right here on this very site on September 12th. This headstone in the Jewish section of the cemetery is about one inch thick marble. What you can see here very clearly are two exit holes. These are exit holes. The reason that these are exit holes is because the National Guard was lined up on the field behind me. This cemetery didn't look this way 75 years ago. Most of these stones were not there. This was an empty field. The tree line behind us masks a 30-foot drop down to the Salesville complex. And you can see where the National Guard troops position themselves between this, this ridge and this tree line up in, the, up in the field between the cemetery and the plant which is behind us. It's a gorgeous September day and the 
it's, this is just about the way it was 76 years ago. This is the type of September weather. Who would think that such a beautiful day would bring such terrible results and tragedy? The people that many people uh, perceive as strike breakers during that particular strike in Salesville may not actually have been strike breakers. They probably were people that were trapped behind the gates by management during the time of the strike. So in terms of working class solidarity at the time of the strike, it is my belief from the remarks by that particular individual and other material that I've researched that there probably was working class solidarity here, true working class solidarity here in Salesville. Also, we would like to credit a lot of the women that took part in the strike and in particular, the flying squadrons from New Bedford and Fall River. Many of the uh, United Textile Workers organized themselves to go to non-union textile mills all up and down Rhode Island in the Blackstone Valley region and into the uh, Patuxent Valley region to organize the non-union plants, such as the non-union one here in Salesville. The strikers were here. The idea was that they would come in behind the, behind the complex where they were doing everything they could, throwing rocks, anything that they could get their hands on at the complex to try and get the workers inside, the strike breakers, intimidated and make them come out. They wanted to shut that place down. National Guard came up and lined up between the mill and the strikers. At some point in time, who knows exactly what triggered it, they decided to open fire on the strikers. These bullet holes were the result of that. There were strikers hiding behind here. We're right in the vicinity of where Charles Gosinski and William Blackwood were shot, along with a third person who were all taken out of here in an ambulance. Gosinski died within hours. Blackwood lingered for days. They were, again, the true heroes, and this monument is a true testimony to the violence on that day. Interestingly enough, the strikers were not successful in shutting the plant down. Theodore Francis Green, the governor of Rhode Island, on September 13th, shut the plant down, and that brought hostilities to an end. I hold in my hand the death certificate of William Blackwood of Central Falls, Rhode Island, who was a loom fixer fr from Ireland. The cause of death, perforating bullet wound of skull, laceration of brain tissue, hemorrhage of the brain, birthplace, Ireland. Again, this is the death certificate of William Blackwood of uh, 8 Hume Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island and he was a loom fixer from Ireland. Now the loom fixers were a very skilled craft within the textile industry. The United Textile Workers sought to organize much of the skilled crafts within the textile industry so that they were very instrumental in the strike, not only here in Salesville, Rhode Island, but also throughout the country. Right now, I'm crouched down behind the headstone, believing that I'm safe from the National Guard gunfire, just like Charles Gorsinski, just like William Blackwood was on September 12, 1934. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Sometimes labor history, not only here in Rhode Island, but around the country, goes unnoticed. Labor's democratic impact on American society sometimes is invisible for much of mainstream of culture and history. Labor paved the way for public education in the United States and also here in Rhode Island. They also sought an end to debt imprisonment, which imp imprisoned thousands of people for owing debt. Also, sick time, personal time, vacation time. The notion of the 40-hour work week was set up and is an accomplishment of the labor movement. 
not only here in Rhode Island, but in the United States. And some people do not realize that. The Rhode Island Labor History Society seek to popularize and celebrate the story of the worker and also the accomplishments of the Rhode Island labor movement. Also, many people may not necessarily know that maternity leave for women was established by the labor movement. This was not given to them. They had to f fight for it. Some people went to prison for it. Some people died for that right that many people take for granted, both union and non-union alike. This is something that we seek to popularize and make sure that the general public here in Rhode Island knows that. And if you would like to be a member of our society, we encourage that. That passion that every one of us has to celebrate the story of the worker, past, present, and future. The story of the worker is the story of us. Not only here in Rhode Island, but here in the United States of America. Thank you, and please visit our website at rilaborhistory.org. everyone for showing up on this beautiful Labor Day in order to show your respects and honor uh, to our past and to use their inspiration to keep the fight alive. And I got to say the Labor History Society over its almost 25 year history has done a lot of things. This is the first time we've ever created a traffic jam in the cemetery. <laughs> but uh, hey, we can't think of a nicer, warmer place to be. <laughs> Kathy Collette, who's the president of the society, was supposed to uh, MC this today, uh, but she called me a little while ago uh, with a doctor's certificate uh, that she wasn't feeling well and couldn't make it, so uh, she handed it off uh, to me. So she was supposed to be doing this, but anyway. Uh, I'm going to uh, just introduce a few people who are going to have a few words to say, and then at the end, uh, we're going to have some uh, labor music, which I think you'll enjoy, uh, with Mary Lee Pottington and... Uh, Kenny Lyons, uh, uh, I won't say he came out of retirement, but uh, he wanted to be here with us. So uh, thank you again for all for coming, and the person who's going to uh, uh, provide some uh, religious greetings for us is the Reverend Dwayne Klinker. He's a former community activist. He was a shop steward with the United Steel Workers of America at BIF, the old Builders Iron Foundry, uh, for those of you old enough to remember that. He's also now a, a minister. Uh, with the United Methodist Church and is the uh, uh, minister at the Washington Park uh, Church in Providence. So without further ado, uh, Reverend Klinker, would you come uh, forward? Uh, a couple of weeks ago that there's two kinds of religion. Uh, religion that basically supports the powers that be uh, and that serves as kind of props for that, and religion that springs up in other places, in other spirits, spirits of solidarity and brotherhood and sisterhood. Back in the day when these events happened, unfortunately, many in official religion, uh, positions of leadership were absent or, or on the side of the industrialists. It's uh, therefore uh, an incredible uh, honor uh, to be asked to, to start us off today. Uh, Al McAloon, who I think now is gone, was a teacher, uh, lived through this period, lived in this area, and Al said that the uh, parishes at that time were composed, uh, they were led by uh, boards of trustees that were bankers and businessmen, and that uh, the people that did the work, that built the schools, that built the churches, that built the hospitals, were taught to be subservient. And they were taught that uh, in many of the parishes. I am so honored to be here today with uh, Father Bob Byrne, who was a very different kind of religious and spiritual tradition in this area a decade ago. Uh, Father Bob and Brother Bob, it's just excellent. So these folks were um, in a very different place in some ways than us, and, uh, but they had just taken all they could bear. 
Uh, that's the way I've heard it. I worked with a guy who hid behind one of these tombstones, actually. Um, and it just had reached the breaking point. They called it stretching out. Anybody here feel stretched, a little stretched out today by the economy? <laughs> and what they were doing was they were asking for what we would call speed ups, but also a lengthening of the working day, also unemployment and layoffs at the same time. <laughs> Folks just had had it and the dam broke in 1934. It had broken before, but it really broke in 1934. The strike began in the South the first workers that went out in the South. It was actually a struggle to organize the South. I guess I'm not the historian here, but, but that's what I know. <coughs> and I know that uh, it took a couple days and then people started being killed. A couple here in a gun battle in the South, and then four, uh, and then seven, and then uh, I think on the 10th of September, uh, it hit here, and people began to be killed here in the resistance to what had become just a massive destructive force on ordinary people's lives. And reflecting on this, I, I was taught as an organizer the official orthodox organizing philosophy, which is that you only fight when you can win. But by all practical purposes, this strike was lost. And I wondered about that. You only fight when you can win. Really? Is that the way it is in our personal lives? Is that really a good attitude to have at a time in which victory seems very, very difficult for us? These workers were fighting for some... I have a feeling that when they were hiding behind the tombstones, they were not thinking about a day in which the plasma TV could be even larger. I have a feeling that there was something in their hearts or minds, a spirit that was catching fire, that had something to do with these deep wells down inside us that are almost unnameable. One of the workers interviewed, I think, by Paul Buell, or Paul Buell reports on it, uh, worked in the bleachery over there uh, that was part of this battle and was a striker, and he said uh, anybody who wasn't afraid, was crazy or a damn fool, he said. But he said, the courage came from somewhere. I don't know where. None of us really know where, do we? It's unnameable, this hunger we have for brotherhood, for sisterhood, this hunger we have for some kind of a world where kids aren't starving or dying because of, of you know, a common disease. We have this hunger. We don't know how to name it. We don't know where it comes from. So some of us give it God names. In the spirit of that hunger, we're here, because we don't know where it comes from either, but we know we need it at a time like this. So this isn't certainly about the past. And when the struggle breaks forward in its next visible component, it won't look like this. But there's something deeply symbolic, as Scotty said to me yesterday, about fighting for life in the middle of a cemetery. It happens that way, doesn't it? Some of the best battles we fight in our lives are battles that we lose. Some of the battles that create the biggest foundation are battles that on the surface are lost. So the service historians say this was lost. In 1934, Scotty told me, the Teamsters go out on strike in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In 1934, the South Southern farm workers, uh, the tenant farmers go out on strike. In 1934, there's this national textile strike. In 1934, workers are marching on Detroit. Have I missed one, Scott? There was another one. Longshoremen Long on, on the West Coast. West Coast. <laughs> All of these strikes, the service historians say, were lost. And yet that year, 1934, was a watershed year for ordinary people in the United States and, in fact, around the world. And out of those defeats, because common ordinary people stood up and claimed that unspoken thing in the center of their being, something significant happens, may it happen again. Let's take a moment now just in, in, in prayer. And uh, I actually learned recently that it's uh, actually a modern tradition that we bow our heads and close our eyes. Um, that's really not in the scripture anywhere, in the Judeo-Christian uh, scriptures. So I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes open and look at the tree, smell the air, Look at the stones, look at the plaque, look at each other. Let's just try for a moment to ask our Creator 
for some of that unspoken, unknown place in our lives to be expanded. That God might give us the grace to go on. That God might give us eyes to see what's going on in the world today as we see what happened in 1934. That those unnamed things of grace might expand in our lives. And that we might dare to form community with each other. Across lines of race, class, sexuality, everything. That we might dare to form community in that same hunger that we might claim and name as the justice and mercy and peace and grace that we also name in our best moments God. May God bless the memory of these women and men. May God bless this ground we stand on. May God bless us. And may we remember that some of the best fights we don't immediately win. We don't wage them to win. We wage them for a better world and for more grace and for more forgiveness and for more love and for more mercy and justice. Amen. 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 I knew I was in trouble the other evening when the, the good minister gave me a call and said he wanted to ask me a few questions. And um, I noticed we got more uh, um, historical lecturing than uh, uh, religious praying, but uh, that's what happens when you have this kind of background. Problem thank, of definition. And thank God we have you, Brother Clinton. But uh, before I go on, I just want to mention that the Labor History Society, although we are 23 years old, we actually existed 10 years prior to that. And we were actually here for the 50th anniversary in 1984. And I'm just curious, was anybody else here in 1984? I was there. Not, most of the people are gone. Or just gone. Got a couple of them. Great. All right. We're hanging on. So uh, we've tried to keep this going. And, uh, you know, the Labor History Society, we charge either $10 or $15 a year for your dues, depending on your situation in life. And to be able to put up a monument like that, you have to say it's very attractive and it's uh, not cheap. Uh, but we also had some great help, uh, particularly from working Rhode Island. And we want to thank Bob Walsh over there, Bob, who uh, signed the check to help us out with that. Bob, uh, And um, our next speaker uh, is someone that a lot of us see. Uh, unlike other labor leaders before him who had much better economic times, uh, times of growth and prosperity, he's been given the almost unbelievable task of trying to hold the line because our standard of living is under attack. George Nee was a community organizer Already you're starting to put that together. Dwayne was and George was. You start to see the, where this is going. <laughs> George was also the founder of the Rhode Island Workers Union Local 76 a long time ago. Some of those unions are still existing today. And over the years, he worked his way up the ladder of success and achievement at the Rhode Island AFL-CIO. And today, he's president of that organization. And he was also instrumental, along with Bob, in helping us Put this beautiful monument up. George, come on up. And thank you all for coming here today. I think that there really isn't a more important place for us to be on Labor Day than here. To honor and remember those people these four strikers and the others that were involved in this strike and all workers who gave their lives, gave their lives so that we can stand here today to remember them, to honor them, and to recommit ourselves to the fight for justice and for economic opportunity for all the workers in our country and in our world. Things have changed a lot since this day in 1934, and they've changed a lot because of this fight and other fights where people struggle. We now have a social safety network that is frayed, but is still there. 
We have a minimum wage, we have OSHA standards, we have unemployment insurance, we have workers' compensation, we have programs that help workers, and we have the right to organize. In 1934, when this massacre, and it was a massacre, took place, workers did not have the legal right to organize. They had the moral right to organize, and they exercised it, but they did not have the legal right to organize. So things have changed a lot, but they haven't changed much at all. Because what they fought for and were fighting for on that day and in that year is still going on today. I mean, what are we all about when it really comes down to it? We, write, we should try to get, not get caught up in the more complicated things, but keep it simple. We are about workers having the right to have a say on their job. We are about workers having the right to have control over their lives and not have their lives controlled by, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt referred to them, the economic royalists. We have a right to control our own life. We have a right to have a say on our job. And yes, we have a right and an obligation and a duty to fight for better wages, for better benefits, and better working conditions, and we should never be ashamed of that. We should stand up proudly to say, yes, our families have a right to economic security and a good wage and good benefits. We can't run away from that. If we run away from that, then why are we here today? We dishonor these people and all workers who fought and struggled. Sometimes there's a lot of rhetoric about this, but we have to remember that people actually got beat and killed and got shot and sacrificed and walked on picket lines and fought for their brothers and sisters to get a better life. That is what we are doing here today. We are honoring all those people. And we have an obligation all of us and every member of this labor movement to go forward, to never retreat, to improve the lives of working people. That is our obligation and that is our duty. And I have a crazy idea that I came up today with. Hey. Like those. <laughs> Wait you hear this one. I think it is disgraceful that our airport is named after Theodore Francis. Yeah! How can we name an airport after a governor who called out the National Guard and shot and killed those four workers? Yeah, yeah. you're right. Why don't we have the Tom Paula Castro Airport, <laughs> the Ed McElroy Airport, the Ed Brown Airport, the Frank Montanaro Airport? Let's get rid of the Theodore Francis Green Airport. Yeah. So that when people ride and get into Rhode Island, they'll scratch their heads a little bit and say, who are those people? And then maybe the union flight attendant can have an announcement and the union pilot can say, you're coming to a state that honors workers who fought so that others can live a better life. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is a particular favorite of mine because he was a student of mine at uh, URI and graduated a couple of years ago. Ryan McIntyre is a uh, very sophisticated historian. He's also one of the most hardworking people you'll ever meet. He's on the executive board of the Labor History Society. He's the one who tracked down the uh, uh, granite makers, the plaque makers, and everything else that had to be done, talk with the cemetery superintendent had all of this arranged. That's all his work. And he's got three jobs. Because in this world, you need at least three to maybe make it by. But uh, Ryan's done most of the work. A lot of us get out here uh, uh, older, and everyone thinks, hey, they're the ones. But no, uh, we're, we're getting smart. We're looking for the younger people now. So we're going to work you to death, because you've got a little spare time, maybe, uh, at the moment. Uh, so before I introduce Ryan, I also wanted to say there's a number of uh, political candidates uh, in the crowd, and 
Uh, I'm not going to point everyone out because I'll miss somebody, but thank you very much for coming, too. today to remember an event that took place just about 76 years ago on this very sacred and holy ground. During the Great Depression, much of the country's textile workforce was full of discontent and many struggled to put food on their table. Many textile mills either closed up and moved down south or went belly up due to management's greed. The textile workers all along the east coast from Maine to Alabama were met with increased workloads and drastic cuts in their pay. In addition, many mill workers experienced worsening conditions. The largest union in the industry, the United Textile Workers, called for a nationwide strike to start around Labor Day 1934 if key worker grievances were not addressed by mill management. Nationally, union and non-union workers struck in solidarity to obtain their goals for better wages and working conditions. Picketing and strikes began to pop up all over the country, particularly here in Rhode Island. The sales company complex was one of the largest in the state. At the time, it employed between 2,000 to 3,000 people, making it the focal point of the textile workers' fight for fairer wages and better working conditions. Shutting down this massive anti-union plant would send a message to local mill management. This was an event where working people took to the cemetery for refuge and solidarity from the police and National Guard at the sales finishing plant. These protesters included men, women, and children of all ages. This cemetery became a battlefield. People died and were injured in this very area. Bullets, bricks, and tear gas were in the air. In fact, so much tear gas had been used that women and children crouched fearfully in their nearby homes from the effects of the riot gas. Machine guns were on the roofs. We can picture it all in our minds now. So let us take a moment and bow our heads together to pay our respects to those who fought and died for a better life for themselves and their families. In conclusion, this Labor Day may the working class of America show strength, solidarity, and unity for events such as the sales of massacre for an updated better life for themselves and their families. Also, we pay homage to those who lost their lives in Woonsocket during the same general textile strike of 1934. May we keep fighting the good fight. Amen. Now at this time I do have some more acknowledgments to make this that made this event possible. I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals and organizations for their contributions to this event. George from Asashic Cemetery Court for his consistent cooperation and support for our ambitions here today. I'm not sure if George is here. Could you just raise your hand and be recognized? I'm not sure if he was able to attend. Okay. Um, the entire Rhode Island Labor History Society Executive Board for their support and encouragement. Thank you very much. Um, Working Rhode Island and the Rhode Island AFL-CIO for their support, both financially and emotionally. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, Reverend Clinker from the United Methodist Church for his involvement here today. Thank you very much, Reverend. <laughs> also, I'd like to thank... Um, Mary and Hair Group for their uh, musical performance, which I'm sure is going to be wonderful. They're about to uh, tip it off in a little bit. Um, <laughs> M.F. Graham and Sun Monuments in Batucket for making this beautiful monument. And also Healy Plaques in Manville um, for making the beautiful plaque. And um, that's all. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it. I'm going to turn it back over to Scott now. Thank you. for the price of one, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to sum it up and then uh, turn it over to our two uh, wonderful singers. Uh, you have to remember that uh, back in 1934 when this strike broke out, there were thousands of people in the streets. And when you look at those people, because they do have the newsreels and the footage of that, they were mostly young people in their early 20s. Just kids out trying to make a better life for themselves and to help their families make ends meet during the middle of the Great Depression. We often forget that. And as Dwayne so aptly pointed out, of the five or six major national strikes in 1934, 
None of them really could be declared a victory. There was a compromise, there was a standoff, there was a six of one, half dozen of the other. But 1934 was a year of decision, make no doubt about that, for organized labor. Because since the mid-1920s, down through the middle of the Great Depression, labor had almost been extinguished. We were a flickering light in a darkened room, ready to go out. But the movement, especially here in the textile strike, which was run by two guys from Rhode Island, by the way, that roiled the waters, that brought people into action, people onto the streets. People began to participate and fight back. They were no longer people acted upon. They were going to be actors on the front of the stage. And although we can stand here today in a beautiful atmosphere, sunshine, blue sky, all we have to do is turn around and look about four rows down. And you'll see that headstone with two holes through it. Those weren't rifles that shot those holes. Those weren't pistols. Those were machine gun bullets trained on our ancestors. And that headstone happened to be very thin, and the bullets went right through it. And you know, if you look at that long enough, those two bullet holes begin to look like eyes, the eyes of history, looking upon what's happened over the last 76 years. And we saw that after 1934, that within a couple of years, the great Congress of Industrial Organization was formed. A union that was inclusive, that brought in women, people of color, immigrants, so that the labor movement reflected the entire workforce, not just a handful of skilled workers. And by World War II, we had finally taken our place and helped the working class in the next 10, 20, 30 years graduate from the working class into the middle class. And the only sad thing about that was that our parents and grandparents, for the most part, did not sit us down and tell us the story of what they went through and how they got out of that mess. Because it was labor that pulled them up. No one else. We pulled ourselves up through the instrumentality of organized labor. And in World War II, which is where I'm going to stop, most of you say, oh, God, a history professor, he'll never stop. <laughs> but in World War II, in that worst conflagration in world history, we sent our troops off to the Pacific, to the Atlantic, and 300,000 of them paid the ultimate sacrifice in dying for our country. But what's often forgotten is that back home, the soldiers of production, the men and women who were still here, turning out the material, because you can't win a war simply with troops. You have to have a lot of other things to back it up. And so tens of thousands of people, people who never worked before in their lives, found opportunities in the factories. But you know what we never hear about? A hundred thousand American workers right. died in industrial accidents during that war. A hundred thousand died at home. Three hundred thousand died on the battlefields of Europe and Asia. And yet the troops came home to a deserved applause while working people were soon forgotten, regardless of their major contributions. But we kept it going so that once we had a union card in our wallet or in our pocketbook, it was a ticket to a better life, to public education, public higher education. I always kid my students by telling them, by 1950, there was finally more students at URI than cows. <laughs> <laughs> and the last cow a fraternity got not too long ago, so they're gone. <laughs> in ending up, let me say, Many years ago, there was a major strike right down the road here in Pawtucket, right on Dexter Street, by the streetcar workers. And the mayor of Pawtucket at that time was a guy named John Fitzgerald. He was a great union guy, a great lawyer, 
a wonderful person who when the Republican Party sent in the sheriffs, when the governor called out the state militia, he deputized strikers in order to keep law and order. Now that's the kind of politician we need today. We have two very uh, distinguished singers, as you'll see momentarily. Uh, Mary Lee Partington, um, who's uh, been singing as uh, long as I can ever remember. And Ken Lyons, who's right there with her. Um, their uh, institutions in Rhode Island, uh, they sing not only labor songs, but songs about uh, immigrants and ethnicity. So uh, they're on our side, and we'd like to have them come forth and uh, give us a couple of uh, renditions. Thank you. that there is no story without conflict and without struggle. And the fact that these songs are sung from one century to the next, from one decade to the next, from one generation to the next, reminds us that the story goes on, the struggle goes on, and we better not forget the words. So please, sing along.
celebrations of the past, but celebrations of our potential commitment to the future. And labor union is never more in need, or this country is never more in need of unionism than now. House Bill 5741, compulsory military service. The internment camps are been designed and they're being built. We have a harder time ahead of us than our forebearers have ever imagined. They didn't let that dream turn them around. Turn them around, turn them around. They didn't let Teddy Green turn them around. They said, keep on walking, keep on talking. Gonna build a brand new world. They didn't let martial law Turn them around, turn them around, turn them around. They didn't let martial law turn them around. They said, keep on walking, keep on talking. Gonna build a brand new world. They didn't let William sail. That's going to conclude our, our program here. You're here. You can actually say you went to a labor event that was done in 45 minutes. Nobody will believe you. <laughs> um, but please, take your time. Get a good look. Take some pictures of the uh, uh, gorgeous uh, monument that we've put up. Uh, take a look at the bullet holes. And uh, I think you'll uh, enjoy yourselves in a uh, reflective sort of way. So again, uh, for those of you who are members of the Labor History Society, uh, you'll continue to get um, uh, communications from us about the different things that we do. For those of you who aren't, <laughs> we've already got your license plates <laughs> and your tie you is no longer near them. <laughs> uh, but if you would like to join, please see me or somebody from the executive board and we'll sign you up. Very inexpensive. <laughs> Uh, go to our website, which is rihls.org. <laughs> Did you see me say that? RihlaHistorySociety.org. <laughs> very easy to find. Okay, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this evening's edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen three times each week here on Channel 14. Join us on Tuesdays at 7 p.m., Thursdays at 8 p.m., and Saturdays at 5 p.m.